A society that is in crisis because it's struggling to deal with the impact of global warming on their own shores and to their own populations. And people are suffering and people are struggling. And it's going to be very easy for governments and groups and communities to essentially victimize those people, those strangers, and the risk gets even greater when there are fault lines around religion or race or ethnicity or so forth. Um, to victimize them because of what's happening. We're going to see this kind of crisis situation more and more often in the future. And that's just around one issue, and that's sea level rise, displacing millions of people around the world. And there are some societies, especially in the developing world, that are going to have a very difficult time coping with that. And what we see historically some of the research, well, living here in the Southwest, we do know if any of you have um, read about or studied the history of this region, that you had times of prosperity where populations of the various indigenous peoples grew and multiplied, and we still have some of those dwellings with us. And then what happened was you had climate change, you had a decrease of natural resources, and you had increased conflict. And so we find historically wars have very often sprung up around those kind of situations, around resources and around populations that are vulnerable to victimization. That's disturbing. The other is drought. We're going to see parts of the country and parts of the world that are going to be increasingly affected by a loss of uh, water. And to talk about this in terms of the future genocide, we don't have to speak in hypotheticals like India and Bangladesh and so forth. We can talk about reality, and that is Darfur. Now, ostensibly, the proximate cause of the genocide in Darfur is that you have the Darfur being a region of the Sudan where the people there were less Arabicized than other parts of the Sudan. Now, what you hear is very often people talk about race, and that's an issue of race. And in fact, the genocidal government of Sudan talks about these racial differences, that they are Arabs, and that the Darfurians are Africans. The reality is there's no difference. It's an artificial distinction. Freud once talked about the narcissism of minor difference, where these tiny little differences are, cre are, are just blown up to cre be these huge schisms between populations which make it easier to victimize them. We certainly saw that during the Holocaust. We saw that during um, the Bosnian genocide. The Bosnian Muslims were some of the worst Muslims you could ever come across. They didn't practice. They, I mean, they defined themselves first and foremost as Europeans, as Yugoslavs. That was their identity. But it didn't matter. In the eyes of the Bosnian Serbs, they were Muslims, they were Turks, Ottomans, and they have all kinds of terminology for it, and they were coming to put all the Bosnian Serb women into harems. And that was what the propaganda was about. And it seems ridiculous. But when your government and your neighbors and the people around you are telling you this is fact and that you need to get on the program, you're not with us, you're against us, it becomes a powerful force enabling victimization. And so in the, in the Sudan, we see this. It, it is, there's no real differences. It's just that these tribes were a little less um, Arabic in culture. They had historically been marginalized politically and economically and, or, and socially by the government um, in Khartoum. And so in the early, I think it was 2003, you had members of these different tribes, the um, Zagavit, the uh, Fur, in fact the Darfur literally means land of the Fur, um, and the Masala people, there were a number of young men who kind of formed these different groups that began attacking some police stations. And their agenda was political, social, economic equality. And unfortunately, they chose to engage in violence uh, to achieve that. Well, the government wasn't hearing this and essentially responded with uh, military force and with organizing these militias that would arrive by helicopter, by camel, by horse into these villages 
killing, raping, and terrorizing populations. Now, that's the proximate cause. There's another deeper reason underlying this genocide, and that is drought and water. Because the thing about it is that that part of the Sudan had been experiencing a drought since the early 1980s. And the targeted tribes are largely farmers. In the northern part of the Darfur, um, among some of the tribes that are more Arabicized, they tend to be much more nomadic. It's no accident that many of the members of the Janjaweed militia groups are from those tribes in the north that because of loss of water have been increasingly trying to encroach upon the land in the south. It's about resources and populations that are perceived to be in the way and given any pretext, such as the organization of the SLM and these other groups, provided the excuse for the government to go in and engage in genocide. The global estimates for the number of people affected by drought um, in this coming century is um, very high. And again, we see, given the right kinds of circumstances, I'm not suggesting this is going to cause genocide everywhere and conflict everywhere, but I'm saying given the right circumstances, the right kinds of schisms and the right kind of, um, or the wrong kind, I should say, of variables, we are going to see increased risk of genocidal violence in many parts of the world. And I think we need to acknowledge that we often think of genocide as something very foreign, except for the fact that genocide does affect the United States. It affects us in many ways, both directly and indirectly. Um, all right, let me be hopeful here for a minute. I'll try to sound genuine. No, <laughs> this is real cause for concern. To counter these trends, I, I do see some real positive things happening around the world that do give me reason to hope. Um, the question is, will they be strong enough to overcome some of these other countervailing forces? I see, for example, a lot of hope around the area of international human rights law. In March of 2006, Lebanon Milosevic died in bed. And for those of you who aren't familiar with him, he was the strong man of Serbia. Um, during the 1990s, during that genocide, and he was in many ways the architect of that violence. What's amazing is not that he died in bed, but that he died in bed in a cell in The Hague. He was on trial for various kinds of crimes that he had perpetrated while he was head of a state, the legitimate head of a state. That was unprecedented. Essentially, he was the um, architect of the violence, he um, lost power, and the international community was able to put pressure on uh, a man by the name of Kostunica, who was the head of Serbia at that point, to uh, remand him over to custody in The Hague. And he was then put on trial, and he was on trial, a fitting followed it for a number of years. Um, his heart condition was, uh, caused numerous halts, but it, it, this was amazing. Um, this isn't the only case like that. You have, for example, the former Prime Minister of Rwanda who was convicted of genocide and crimes against humanity a number of years ago. Again, he was a head of state who was convicted for what he had done as the leader of his country, as the legitimate leader of his country. The, the history of international law has usually meant that um, heads of state and political officials um, are subject to what is known as sovereign immunity. If you're doing something for your country <laughs> while you're in charge, nothing's going to happen to you. Yep. That's changing. Augusto Pinochet, know who Augusto Pinochet was? Yeah. Sure. Right. He was, he got the surprise of his life when he's in a hospital bed just a few years ago in London, recovering from back surgery, when the, his bodyguards were disarmed by London uh, police officers, and he was put under arrest. 
basically, for the crime